Okay. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, Wahid. Just waiting for you. Thank you. Um, I hope you enjoyed your lunch, but ate just enough to keep you nourished, but not put you to sleep. So, Indian food does that. So what, as Maya said, we'll be discussing on this panel is we will examine the role of sports, art, and cultural programs in addressing violent extremism by locating the spaces for prevention, countermeasures, and de-radicalization through these avenues. To speak about this, I have a really interesting panel who've done a wide variety of stuff. I'll start from the far end over there. That is Wahid Rahman Para is youth. Am I pronouncing that correct, Para? He's the youth president of the Jammu and Kashmir People's Democratic Party. He has worked on peace building initiatives at the grassroots level and on democratization of the political setup. He's presently working as secretary sports council under which many initiatives connecting more than 100,000 youngsters of the state has started. And you also started something on sport called the sports. The mic, please. Sports for all. So hopefully you'll tell us how sports helps, especially just a couple of days after Argentina pulled out of a match in Israel, and we know that had political um, inputs, uh, ramifications. Then next to him, <coughs> we have Ashhar Farhan. He is the co-founder of Lama Khan. Did I pronounce that correctly? Hyderabad's open cultural culture center that provides a free independent platform for cultural and literary events. It is an inclusive critical space that hosts hundreds of plays, music concerts, readings, debates, talks, workshops, etc. It's evolved a unique model of being entirely independent of corporate and state sponsorships. And I believe at the two ends of the spectrum, the kind of thing that they've hosted are a play that kind of showed Nathuram Gorse in a sympathetic light. And at the other end, they have been accused of uh, having events in support of Rohit Vemula. And also before Telangana was made, events that kind of celebrated Telangana culture. <clears throat> so a really interesting space. Next to him, the only lady on this panel that would otherwise have been a manal, and no one wants that, we know. Uh, Rana Safvi is a historian. She has a deep love for verse and a passion for culture. In fact, she started this music Twitter thing as well, which hopefully she'll tell us about. She runs a popular blog called hazrat -e dilli which talks about Delhi's culture, food, heritage, and old age tradition. She is founder and moderator of Shire, hashtag Shire on Twitter. And she's also done a piece for us, a video piece uh, showing us Chandni Chalk and Ghalib's Haveli. Uh, thank you for that, Rana. It was very nice. It got lots of hits. Had it been ad supported, it would have helped. Uh, but thank you so much. It was truly beautiful. And finally, on my immediate right is Priyank Mathur highly accomplished, much degree, hassle karod person from MIT and all that. Uh, but he is right now here because he's the CEO of Mythos Lab. Mythos? Mythos? How do you pronounce it? Mythos. Mythos. Mythos Lab, a company that partners with comedians around the world to create funny videos and counter the narrative of violent extremism. It's conducted programs on behalf of the US Department of State, United Nations, and Hedaya. And he has also worked with uh, the Department of Homeland Security in the US. So maybe you could get us some insights on how humor helps there. So uh, I've spoken long enough and I'm wheezing now. So I'll just start off with a video of uh, something that Mythos Lab created. This is to discourage people from joining the ISIS. Yeah, this was a video we made with a group in India called East India Comedy. And um, I'll let the video speak for itself, but hopefully it makes you guys less inclined to join ISIS. So than let's watch that and then we'll get on. And this is just a clip of the video. The whole thing is on YouTube. Please do watch it. One-way ticket is enough. It doesn't have to come in return. 
तू क्या है क्या है मतलब तू बॉम्ब है बहन चोद I says from resign to want Sir, I Sir in English I want to resign from I says but we're not I says we're I sell Daesh Yaar aaj ka naam kya hai We are is Well whatever it is Sir I want to quit मैं एक साल से बेंच पर बैठा हूँ एंड ऑल आई एम डूइंग इज इशूंग प्रेस रिलीज फॉर अटैक्स दैट इज ऑल्सो डन बाई अदर ग्रुप्स वी आर बी टू सी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन बॉम द कंज्यूमर्स सो हु केयर्स हु गेट्स क्रेडिट है सर आई डू छुट्टी नहीं मिलती है जॉब सेटिस्फैक्शन नहीं है and also why are all my checks issued in pdcs post death checks that's a policy do you see anyone else complaining after our ahmed ko dekha aste kuch bolte hue sir kyunki wo dono mar chuke hain do you know where they've gone they've been promoted to paradise they must be chilling with the 72 sir urges. please do not start with all this after life yeah present life mein to office mein ek bhi ladki nahi nazar aa rahi hai mera jo tinder hai na wo grinder ban chuke hain kya dancer bulai to thi company off site par तब तो बड़ा नाच रहा था बम लग दी मेनू पे सर प्लीज आपको भी पता है तब आपने क्या किया था चाय वाले को ना क्रॉस टेस्ट करवा के वहां खड़ा कर दिया आई I मीन mean, आज भी जब वो ऑफिस में आता है ना लोग खाम का एक्साइटेड हो जाते हैं हमने कमेडियंस भी बुलाए थे सर वो कमेडियंस हर साल ना वो ही घिसे बैठे जोक सुनाते हैं साउ टू टेरिस वेकअप इन द मॉर्निंग Well, they set up a time bomb. Time bomb. What is the terrorist's favorite TV show? The Big Bang Theory. There are no chicks here. I don't know why you call yourself ISIS. You guys should call yourself I, bro. <laughs> okay, I get it. You're not happy. Yeah. What if we give you the corner office? Sir, go go fire. We can force a woman to be a wife. That is arranged marriage. We let it be head the journalist. Sir, Bombay time se kisko kya fark padta hai? What if we broke a world peace? Would you do that for me? No, I'm just messing with you. Sir, please. I just want to quit and I want to go home. Think of all the good you can do here. Remember, the Almighty has chosen you to do His work. The Almighty doesn't say go kill kids, women, or innocents. As the book says. We will cast terror in the heart of unbelievers. This is really out of context, and please stop Zakir making it. It also says that do not kill anyone that God has made sacrosanct. Unbelievers will be punished with terrible agony in this world and the hereafter. But God loveth not aggressors. Fight against them so God can punish them with your hands and disgrace them. Fight against those that fight against you, but do not begin hostilities. Killing a soul is like killing all of mankind. मैं बाद में आता हूं ओके सूरत द होल बुक या एंड यू शुड टू या सो दैट्स जस्ट अ क्लिप बट द होल थिंग इज ऑन यूट्यूब प्लीज डू वॉच इट सो लेट मी जस्ट गेट टू द ऑब्वियस क्वेश्चन फर्स्ट प्रियंक since we're talking about art and culture and things that are not quantifiable uh how would you define success how do you know this has actually prevented people or de-radicalized de-radicalized anyone and stopped them from joining the isis yeah that's a very fair question so um to to see the uh to see the effect of these videos i think it's important to know going into it who the target audience is so We knew that if you're the target audience for this video is not people who are already hardened terrorists, right? If you've already been in ISIS for years, chances are you're not going to see this video and if you do, it's probably not going to change your mind to quit. It's more who we were trying to get with this video were the people who might be on the edge. So maybe they're tempted, maybe they've heard of these terrorist groups, maybe they're bullied at school, maybe they feel like they don't fit in for whatever reason the ideology is hovering in their life um but they haven't fully committed to it and they're trying to make a decision. So the way we measure success um this video was funded by the US State Department um and um the MNE sort of the monitoring and evaluation piece of this uh was in three components so there's sentiment analysis so we used just sort of uh 
you know, word clouds and other ways to determine what people were saying about ISIS in Hindi-speaking parts of India before, during, and after this video. And what we saw, there was a list of terms that the State Department was monitoring um, that were sort of pro-ISIS terms emanating from this, reason, from this region, hashtags like pro-Daesh hashtags, etc. We saw a 10% reduction in pro-ISIS uh, online social media mentions. Big caveat, there's no way we can prove that that was just because of this video. A sure. lot of things might have happened in the world, but we know it didn't make things worse. The other thing we did was look at sort of the comments. This video got over 25,000 comments within its first week on YouTube and Facebook. It got over a million and a half views within two weeks. 98.6% um, of the comments were positive. You know, saying things like, I really love this video. There was one user who was saying, this makes me proud of my religion as an Indian Muslim, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the 1.4% that were remaining were neutral. So they were more things like, you know, my sound was off in my left headset or whatever, just had nothing to do with the video. Um, and the third thing that we're working on now is predictive modeling. So we will look at uh, a video like this after the video is made and um, using uh, some of our proprietary algorithms that our team in Cambridge has developed, uh, we could look at when people were you know, pressing X on their browser and when they were hitting the like button on Facebook. So we can see which exact joke resonated the most which tells us in future videos what we should do more of and what we should do less of. Like the, the arranged marriage joke about Indian parents, that was by far the most popular, that's when most people pressed like or shared it or whatever. Um, but it tells us what kinds of characters. And one last thing I'll just say in response to the how do you measure the success, um, I think this speaks to the unique ability of comedy as opposed to other art forms that we were able to talk about a really sensitive topic. Um, any of you who are sitting in this room who've worked in this region know, you know, this, as you saw, there were two characters talking about the Quran in this video, quoting verses from the Quran. If we did that as a dramatic short film in India, I'm, I'm almost certain that there would have been some outcry on social media. Some groups would have been offended, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We didn't get a single, like I said, 98.6% positive comments. Hindustan Times, Times of India, CNN, they all ran the story. So the video got a lot of play, but no groups were offended. Nobody even, um, and, and, and in fact, we even got a direct message. Me and um, Azim and, uh, and Sapan, two of the comedians who wrote this video, uh, sent to our Facebook inbox, which was not a public comment, and when you see what they said, you'll know why. And the person said, um, he said, I I I'm really thankful for your video. My brother, and the, the term he used was, was falling into bad company, which I think we, we kind of know where he's going with that. He says he had left the house. He's not speaking to my father, not speaking to us. We've emailed him, called him, nothing. But then I sent him your video, and for the first time in six months, he responded and said, that's funny. So what it showed is that it could start a conversation with someone who's going down a path of radicalization. Anyone who's worked in de-radicalization knows that's the hardest part, is starting a conversation. Right, so um, yeah, that's a really funny video. Although I think someone not being offended in today's day and age has not so much to do with the content, but a person at that time didn't thought it worthy of offense because people get offended about the most non-offensive stuff in today's day and age. So I think it's got to do that. Rana, um, if you could come in here, um, you know, just resolve this dilemma for me. Poetry, which is, you know, your first love and what you're most passionate about, what I've understood of it or read about poetry comes from a position of a radical thought. You know, whether it is people like Sahil Rudhyan V. Taj Mahal, with a completely different view of, of uh, the tomb. Uh, and even poetry from across the world, or writing, People with radical thought come up with, with poetry, the most effective poetry. So poetry as a device or tool for de-radicalization, which itself is an outcome of radical thought, resolve that for me. Uh, we had an entire the thing movement, the progressive writers movement, who only wrote radical poetry and very revolutionary poetry and played a huge role in. Uh, the freedom struggle in the subcontinent. And uh, they, uh, their poetry in turn enthused a whole lot of other people. Like even today when we have a problem or anything, when we see something happening, we start quoting Faiz and Habib Jalib and okay, okay, then Josh Malih Abadi, et cetera, et cetera. And Sahil Ludhianvi, of course, every time there is a class struggle. So uh, it helps you, I think, to place things in context. Also, Urdu poetry, as we just saw in this video, that that man actually 
presume that the other person who is sitting in front of whom of, of him whom he's trying to brainwash would not have read about the Quran or he was very surprised when he says, no, you've read the whole Quran. So Urdu poetry is also steeped like any English poetry, like for example, P.G. Woodhouse, you can't understand P.G. Woodhouse unless you know all your hymns and the Old Testament. It's similarly, in uh, Urdu poetry also, you have to have a deep knowledge of the religion. So the, to understand that. So I think that uh, any creative expression presumes a level of intelligence, presumes a level of knowledge, and uh, knowledge is what removes ignorance. And uh, I think I will just go back to this video that uh, I've been also writing a lot on uh, Islam. I've written a book called Tales from Quran and Hadith, in which I've actually quoted passages, dialogues, all the dialogues in the stories that I've written are from the Quran, which I've just paraphrased. So um, somebody, a Muslim, who uh, you know, like commented on it and said that this is blasphemy because you're calling it stories from the Quran. He himself did not know that God is supposed to be the greatest storyteller and the Quran is only told in terms of parables and stories, which I simplified and put it forward. And uh, I think the biggest problem, the thing that's working against us, and I'm talking of uh, radicalization of Muslims, is that they don't know anything about their own religion. They just learn the Quran by heart, which is Arabic. So you just shake yourself and keep learning it. You have no idea what it's saying. So you believe anything that the other person tells you. So, and that is what is happening. Uh, the, it works in the other way also, because there is an otherization of Muslims also. Because since we don't know much about our religion, we are not able to portray it. And you, they only know what is portrayed through common uh, media, whether it is TV or books or whatever it is, and you have an image of only a terrorist, like you showed in this clip. So poet, whether it is poetry, whether it is literature, whether it is really reading about your religion, I think it's knowledge which makes you powerful and can help in removing ignorance and de-radicalization of uh, the youth. Right. Thanks. Um, OK. Um, you know, um, in Hyderabad, Ashraf uh, Ash Ashraf, uh, the, it's La Lama Khan, right? I'm getting it. Ashraf uh, has this safe space where you can perform art, um, poetry, you know, uh, dance, drama, discussions. Um, now, you have kind of had cultural events or ar artistic events, you know, from all sides of the ideological spectrum. Do you find any change in how people react to this stuff, and it's been eight years. Um, and and I'm, I want to tie this to internet becoming this ubiquitous, you know, kind of insight into our lives, where outrage on everything is immense. Like something on something that I mean, I I personally, you know, find Bapu is my biggest hero, and I think God say it would be very difficult to justify anything about him. However, it would be great to have a play about that. Uh, and at the same time, you know, the other issues that you take up. Have you found a change in how people receive this? Is it becoming easier or more difficult since internet became a tool that has kind of invaded all our lives? Right. So, uh, one of the things that, you know, we tried, uh, it was an inspiration for Lama Khan is a, um, you know, very simple line that Prem Chand had written in 1933, I think. Um, where he said when you know the first progressive writers conference was being organized i think in delhi i'm not sure where ke hame husn ka mayar badalna hai hame husn ka mayar badalna hai we, ka mayar. Mayar, that mayar. is the measure of beauty we need to change the measure of what's beautiful right so the classical poetry if you look at had a different aesthetic to it so that's actually a, a challenge and one imagines that What's beautiful, and by beautiful, I just don't mean phys physical beauty, but aesthetics are a constant, they are not. Um, and it's been an endeavor within, you know, with Lama Khan and outside to, um, to push, our, push those boundaries of what's beautiful, right? Um, so, uh, I mean, a part of, uh, so, I mean, if the culture is dynamic, it's actually really up to us to take culture into those places. And you know, a lot of um, radicalization, and I do not mean just the radicalization of Muslims per se, but you know, radicalization that we see all, all, all across, especially India, 
is also due to a lack of culture. So um, th there are things to be discovered, and you know, we are, I'm constantly discovering them uh, on the digital medium, which are uh, which need to be put out and back. Uh, for instance, you know, uh, there is this Kavali, uh, written by a poet from Hyderabad, on Krishna. It's a Kavali on Krishna. You guys should you know uh, check it out on the YouTube. Uh, which says kanahi uh, yaad bhi hai yaad bhi kuch hai hamari right so it's it's been sung by uh, a lot of pakistani uh, kawals as well as indian kawals but the fact is that it's it's a bhajan but the idiom is kawali and uh, and it's beautiful right so and you would see that in the in the video the people who are sitting there are it's 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 a pakistani mehfil Right, and there are people sitting and who are really appreciative of it, uh, who, who are enjoying that poem. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, Mr. Sharwani, who used to be in uh, Delhi, he's just moved to Hyderabad. Who, uh, and I don't know whether many of you know this, that Bhagavad Gita's most translations have been in Urdu, because people in the 19th century, up to the you know mid 20th century, more people knew to read and write Urdu than Hindi. So as a result, to make Gita accessible to them, there were a lot of translations of Gita in meter and rhyme in Urdu. And Mr. Shirwani recites the Gita in Urdu. And it's, it's almost like, you know, Mughal Azam type of a language. It's an extremely flowery language, extremely, you know, uh, heartening to listen to it. So, I mean, we've been organizing those sort of things, you know, or Kabir, etc. So the idea is that over a period of time, for example, in Hyderabad, there was hardly any appreciation for Kabir. I mean, a couple of people would, you know, listen to Kabir once in a while, etc. But for example, you keep bringing Prahlad Tipani over and over again. Uh, you know, Shabnam Virmani performs, etc. So then, you know, slowly uh, appreciation for Kabir, you know, who Kabir is, develops. And you have a whole aesthetic coming up and there are kids who are looking for anchors. Really, you know, some meaning in this postmodern you know, emptiness to anchor themselves with. And they find their anchors here instead of you know going somewhere else so i think it's it's uh, a digital medium does serve a very uh, you know powerful thing but it really is not as free as you think it is and we ought to be able to direct these in certain places you know for example rekhta does that you know uh, rana herself does this and there are a lot of other people who've been you know trying to push this there is the uh, the uh, the hindi kavita i think is, is this channel right and uh, yeah, and, and there's Urdu studio where, you know, there are people who are reciting. I mean, Urdu poetry and Urdu language itself has been the, really a revolutionary language. I mean, it's the language of Indian independence and the entire thing. So we need to be able to, we can't go back in the past, but we need to go forward into discovery of this and creating this heritage. And I'm using the word create the heritage <laughs> for our, our society because uh, really it's an active act of, of, Picking from these things and putting these together as a constellation into which our society can, you know, uh, breathe and prosper. Right. Uh, what does Lama Khan mean? Uh, Lama Khan actually, uh, it's a Sufi concept. Okay. So mak Makan actually means a place or a position. And uh, Lama Khan means without a bound or without any specific location. Right? Fluids. So, yeah, it's yeah, boundless and fluid. Yeah. Now, um, Finally, uh, you know, uh, coming to Wahid. Wahid, you have uh, worked, you do work with the Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir, and we know that state is uh, wrought with a whole generation of, um, you know, youth who the level of radicalization or the instances are, you know, disproportionately higher than the rest of the country, and a lot has to do with propaganda, the kind of media they consume. And you also are doing initiatives with sports. Um, you're the only one who actually has seen any uh, interaction with, in the sporting arena as far as getting youth involved or concerned. Just tell us how does that work and with do stuff like, you know, some Kashmiri youth getting into the IPL, there was another, um, uh, you know, in the cricket team. Uh, how does that actually change the narrative and, and give them a different kind of outlet for their energy uh, and how well, successful is it? Well, uh, even though our 
problem in Kashmir is very political and also a very regional conflict it has been for years. But then now the emerging challenge that we are facing in the state is that we are a young state with 65% youth population and then geographically divided into three regions, Jammu, which is predominantly Hindu area, Kashmir is Muslim, Ladakh is Buddhist. So the emotion of state really doesn't exist and there's no one sentiment in the state when you see the larger context of Jammu and Kashmir state. So today the biggest challenge that we are facing is that there are young people, there's an entire debate in the media also about young people getting recruited into militancy. Sometimes it's also about the educated uh, guys getting into militancy. So this whole debate is going on and the reason when we try to understand that what's wrong and why are these young people getting inspired into violence. Uh, so we may differentiate with the larger ideologies, whatever is going on across the world, but the basic doctrine of death is almost same everywhere. So young people seeing a lot of dignity in death. That is the biggest challenge when it comes to that. Why do young people volunteer for death? Why do they see a lot of dignity in that? And if they start seeing dignity in the process of death, then you can't really stop the recruitment in itself because death as a deterrent is not really acting beyond a point. So what we try to exactly do is that once you have so much of young, we created sort of a huge campaign on sports. And the reason for choosing sports was very simple that all these youngsters who join insurgency or militant groups. So the moment they volunteered into militancy, it is decided that they are not, you know, they are willing to die for the cause, whatever they represent. And the moment you say that I am, you know, in any ideology you are. So in a way you always say that I don't care for myself, I don't respect my own body. And if you're not willing to respect your own body, you're not going to respect others. The way we try to educate these guys about self-respect, respecting your own body, or loving yourself was choosing sports as one of the powerful alternatives where it's an inclusive space. It is irrespective of region, religion, you bring people together. So we chose some 52 sports disciplines in the state where the idea was that the youth of Jammu, Kashmir and Ladakh, irrespective of region and religion should come together and one sentiment of the state team should form so that you laugh together, you cry together, you have a place where you actually feel together. And it really worked to an extent not all solutions can come from sports, but it just it is uh, acting as a very powerful tool. So we had some 200 play fields in the state, which uh, in just one year we made 561, and we designed a campaign, Sports for All, where the idea was that every village should own a team in the name of the village. So then every village has a captain, manager, in, into 15 players. So it, that was the idea of creating and connecting the youth in all 3,000 villages in Kashmir particularly. So you built youth leaders and also innovate sports as a meaningful engagement and also bring some pride in life where you think that the role models of the young people are not born out of dead bodies. Where the role models are not, you know, you don't have to die to emerge as a role model, but you have positive alternative role models born out of, you know, sports, maybe cricket, become international. Uh, you have fans like Messi, not just regional, local, or India, Pakistan, within, you know, limiting your uh, heroes. So you just emerge that you, you, you put sports and emerge multiple role models out of positive stories and uh, use sports as a very powerful medium. It has, it has helped to a lot of extent. You have Manzoor Pando, it became a big buzz. Parvez Rasool, you have a lot of other people in the state who are actually doing well and people are f able to connect to them. They're able to connect with the country as well. They're able to connect with the larger continent as well in multiple ways. So sports, see, we see one of the soft invasions because a lot of people literally feel difficult in, in just, you know, when, once we see conflict in the narrative of security only, it becomes very difficult to connect to people. So that is one. And secondly, it also helped us that in the entire, uh, you know, the ecosystem, when girls are really undermined and they feel it's very difficult for girls to come out, the only space, the moment girls are in the field, they feel like their bodies are an asset to themselves and the sense of control in a play field is huge. But the moment a girl is able to kick, she feels like I'm in charge of my own body and I don't need somebody to control me. So that was also creating an inclusive sports that also helped a lot. And some of the stories where, you know, young people, Majid was a success story when the guy from Anathnaku got recruited into militancy came back because there was a huge campaign. He was a football player in area and huge campaign across state and in the country also that you should come back. The sense of empowerment and acknowledgement in sports is huge and sense of pride. Sure. And we see that a lot of young people who lose pride get fall prey to the violence. So reclaiming the pride with sports is a huge means of uh, communication that is being used across the world and I think Kashmir 
it has also somehow achieved something. And another story was like the Afsha, a girl who was seen pelting stones uh, outside yeah, her that college. Was very good. That, that was a global story. And when she was talked by Times of India, she said, I wanted to play for India. That changed the whole debate in the state. So I think these are positive stories which have a lot of impact where young people feel like that a life is not a liability, it's an asset. Sure. That is the message we try to convey through sports. Now, um, this, this, this to everybody, um, when we talk about using art or music or, you know, culture, humor for de-radicalization, uh, much of this starts as underground movements, or at least, at least used to. What my question is, is that approach going to change dramatically in the digital age? And why I ask that is that there is no underground movement anymore. There's no underground music. Now it's on YouTube. It's been discovered in one week by 100,000 others. Like this entire, in Punjab, there was this pop, it's illegal to use the cheer word, but you know, they say, Akha put, you know, chamara de. That is, and it's been on for a long time. But ever since it was discovered on YouTube, it's, you know, Indian Express has done a story on it, we've done a story, everyone's done a story on it. It's, it's no longer underground. Uh, at the same time, because of markets being such an important aspect, you know, you can't just have niche artists using artistic work for de-radicalization. It has to become a pop phenomena. Now, in the pop phenomena, like if you see the case of Quantico, you know, one little case has led to a backlash. Now, Pakistan, it's another backlash, and people have to react to it for market reasons. So there is an absence of an underground movement because there's nothing underground anymore. Larger pop culture will not embrace something that is even slightly controversial. So then, in, in this digital landscape, you think art as a counter-radicalization measure still will prosper or now market on eyeballs and CPM clicks per million is going to take over and everyone's going to play safe because nothing is effective if it's not mainstream. Well, I have a take on that. I, I, I don't think that, um, I don't know, I don't think that mainstream would necessarily shy away from controversial. I think, you know, I live in Boston right now and obviously the US is undergoing a very different political era than ever before. Um, but there's so much art that's taking this issue on head on, right? I mean, there's already, I was in Los Angeles for meetings like three weeks ago, and the studio I was meeting with told me they've already greenlit a movie on the Charlottesville protests, which is gonna take on racial violence very directly. So, so I do think that there's still room in mainstream media to take on controversial subjects. In fact, sometimes those get more clicks and more CPMs. Um, uh, so, so I think there's room, and also I think that um, the underground, you're right, that's a really good observation. There's no, there's no such thing as being underground anymore, um, but there's still sort of credibility, I think, that local performers and actors and poets have, um, some more than others. Like in India, the reason we partner with social influencers, groups like East India Comedy and TVF and AIB, is because most of the young people in the demographic we're trying to reach uh, find those artists more relatable uh, and more credible than, say, uh, you know, a Bollywood superstar or a Hollywood superstar. Um, so I think there's still avenues that you could But use. that's also because Bollywood superstars don't take a stand. Because the political climate in the US, like, I, I, while I would love to make that comparison more often, but there is a political culture in the US where um, the First Amendment is freedom of speech. That trumps everything else. That trumps Trump even. Whereas here, the culture is not of, that is not your primary liberty. Your primary, you know, kind of almost your duty is subservience to family, community, mohalla, mummy, papa, someone or the other. So culturally, you know, I think the experience, the US experience, the India experience may be very different. So just to come to the credibility point, it's not because alternate or, uh, you know, the, the non-mainstream stars have more credibility. They have more credibility because mainstream stars say nothing. Right. But in the US, that's not the case. Mainstream has more credibility there. Yeah, right. But, I, but my point is that in both media landscapes, there is a section of entertainers. There are different sections that have credibility. So I think the challenge for CV practitioners will be identifying who that is. And like you said, it'll be different in America and different in India. Um, uh, you know, yeah. can I just add to this? So um, you're right that there's no uh, underground, right? But on the other hand, um, there are some interesting parallels that you could draw, for instance, um, the lynchings which have happened throughout the country, right, of, of you know, people being 
lynched in whichever way. Um, and there are people who've taken the videos of these, and these videos have gone viral on the digital media of people, you know, being brutally murdered. Uh, but if you posit this against um, what we've been watching on our movies, right, where uh, Amitabh Bachchan, you know, as a police officer, has his hands tied, so he takes on a vigilante avatar in the nights, and he does exactly what, uh, you know, these radical youth are doing in lynching. They're, he's essentially lynching the, uh, the villains without a due process. So over years, okay, uh, thanks mostly to Salim Javed type of dialogue and screenplay writers, we have legitimized violence and we have leg legitimized, we have normalized, um, you know, uh, radical action as the only way, as a heroic way to deal with situations. Is that a cause or an effect? I think, I think to a large extent it's a cause because if you look at when, you know, Shole and Zanjeer and all these movies came in, right? Uh, you, you did not see those lynchings at those, that point in time, but what happened is that it's, it's, it's become a bit of a heroic thing to step out of the law and take, take personal action against what you believe is, is right, okay? And there is no rule, role for state. So once you leave the state out of, uh, and you s stop believing and you start communicating as a cultural production that the state is helpless to provide you with justice in whichever way, right? I mean, for example, you say that there is a law against beef, but the law is so weak and the state is so weak that, you know, I have to do something about it myself. I mean, I'm not even getting into whether the law is correct or not, but the fact is that a new normal was created by the Hindi film industry, that violence was legitimized and glorified. I mean, it's done even in Hollywood, but it's not done in the ways that, uh, for example, the Telugu cinema has done. I mean, in the Telugu cinema, uh, the hero is always an extremely angry, violent, brooding guy. You know, the, so on one hand, we have, uh, you know, a subtle nod towards uh, normalizing uh, radical behavior. On the other hand, we also see that not all voices are actually able to get onto uh, the digital medium properly, right? There might be some legitimate grievances, some legitimate alternate voices, okay, which do not find uh, f find a way out, okay? Or at times that the digital medium is not the only medium, okay? For example, I'll tell you this, our own experience of demonetization. So just after the demonetization, uh, in Hyderabad, there was a large, you know, upswell of public opinion against demonetization because, I mean, you know, Hyderabad probably has a larger informal economy than most of the cities as a ratio of people who work in the informal sector. And they were all, you know, almost starving, etc. So at Lama Khan, what we did is we did a mushaira. So there were about 30, 40 uh, Hindi, Telugu and Urdu poets who came up. And you know, read out poetry, which is satirical in Dakhni. Uh, you'll find some of it on YouTube, very little of YouTube, but what, has hap what happened is over days, that went viral, okay, as a form of protest. So you knew that there were funnier forms of dealing with, you know, an acute situation like demonetization, uh, rather than, you know, going and ransacking ATMs or doing whatever. I mean, humor is very yeah. effective, as yeah. you know. Yeah. Even Mythos Lab has done it. I you know, myself used to write satire. Even Mythos Lab. Sorry. Or he, even Mythos Lab. I mean, yeah, exactly. is a no, I mean, example. even in the Indian sense. Yeah. Uh, but um, Rana, uh, talking about mainstream, you know, whether it's a cause and effect, uh, and um, j doesn't that kind of a you know popular legitimacy to an alternate to the state only become popular if that is reflecting reality. I mean, I, I mean, a, a lone man taking on the state as a theme for a film probably wouldn't work in Sweden or Norway. I mean, they'd say, what are you talking about? That, that doesn't happen here. So uh, 
could you just weigh in on the cause and effect thing and also on popular culture having to embrace a narrative in order for it to be effective, otherwise... See, um, uh, larger than life characters always work. Because everybody has those aspirations, I wish it could be me, or but for the grace of God that could be me. So Amitabh Bachchan has that kind of uh, imp impression and impact on people that you want to emulate him. And as uh, Ajar was saying that uh, his Zanjeer and his Shole characters were initially copied when I was young, that is the time uh, I was in college when Shole came, Zanjeer came. So people emulated him, mimicked his dialogues, but today they are imitating his action. But uh, the, com coming away from there to another, the same point of yours on uh, media and digital and online and underground, you see, one the thing that uh, which we very rarely talk about is, are these online portals which have these ready-made answers for religion. And that is also a very... Um, potent tool in the hands of uh, people who are trying to radicalize. Especially you have these online ummas where you ask a question and you have a ready-made answer. And there it is that they are teaching you the superiority of a particular religion. That this religion is better, that religion is better. And then you come to, as we were talking of since that's the field I'm working in and I have a lot of experience in Shairi, then you come to Shairi. And you have somebody who's a mainstream poet, a Bollywood poet, Majru Sultanpuri, who says that Jibreel has come to me and said that this is a revelation by God. That the only religion is the religion of the heart, the rest is that you are being uh, misled. So when you have things like this, this is I think a far more effective tool of conveying that religion is not about your superiority, religion is not about killing or as uh, Mahid was saying that uh, embracing death, but embracing love. So these are the ways in which we, there are many ways in which we can counter. Movies also show this, but uh, this one big menace that I find today, and I deal with it a lot, is this uh, online uh, radicalization where you have a particular image of a religion, of a community, and it's from both sides. As I said, the othering of the other side. So this is something which has to be dealt with uh, through music, through videos, as the video he showed, I've been very impressed by that video. Right. So I'm going it's back great. again and again to it that, you know, like this man saying, Ki, you've read the whole Quran, so, you know, I find it so uh, effective that you are radicalizing a person <laughs> by brainwashing him about something which he's supposed to be if getting affected by, yet he has no knowledge of, because you yourself have no knowledge of it. Sure. So these are the movements, I think, they are no longer underground. They are all being done online and digital, and I don't think that they are in the dark web or whatever it is called. Sure, I'm not, not very familiar with these terms, but they're all very above board and being used as tools. So we have to also use whatever tools we have in our uh, hands, whether it is movies, whether it is uh, videos or music of poetry or whatever to show that this is not the message that so such and such religion wants to convey or such and such a person or icon wants to convey. Okay, well he come into the state like, you know, while artists and sportsmen and sports people or other, you know, uh, civil society members can work to try to create something, it has the biggest impact when the state gets involved. Um, I, I was listening to this podcast and I highly recommend others listen to it if you're interested in the subject. It's called Romeo and Juliet in Kigali, How a Soap Opera Sought to Change Behavior in Rwanda. It's an NPR podcast. And it's a case study of how, um, you know, after the Hutu and Tutsi violence in Rwanda, which is hideous and I'm sure everybody knows about how bad it was, uh, they came up with this love story between two villages and it ran, it's run some 700 episodes. And while at least the behavioral psychologist who has, you know, came up with this said that it has changed people's behavior, even if it hasn't changed their mindset. But it was so effective and it had such a huge impact because the state got involved and used radio, which before that was used as a hate spreader in, in, the US, in, in uh, Rwanda. So to what extent does the state's involvement in taking something like this, the sports initiative, across add to the impact or is it, can it happen to the same level without the state's involvement? I think uh, state's involvement is very important and uh, yes, we can do sports without states as well. It's possible now you have corporate leagues, you have business leagues coming in. It's, 
equally important. We have national, international championships also happening. But to, so as, as far as the role of facilitation comes, the governments are required. And not only sports, but we can do a lot of other things, uh, art also. I mean, radio has been a huge source of entertainment and reaching out to the young people. Once young people are getting radicalized or listening to the different voices on social media, then radio can also play a very important role. What uh, it's important, I know, in, in situations where young people are like, uh, surrounded by an ecosystem and they get narratives which they are being fed continuously and consistently. It's important that positive stories across the world, across the country should come, which basically, you know, give again, uh, regenerate the hope among the young people. That's very important and that's what we exactly are banking upon, that bringing positive stories out of conflict and changing the larger narratives. At the same time, it's also, uh, you know, when you talk about uh, bringing uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, bringing uh, the role of states. So I think uh, governments have a very important role. The institutions in itself have become hurdles to a lot of change uh, initiatives. So it's very important that the governments allow such changes to happen to the governments at state and the central level. That will certainly create a lot of impact. But uh, my point is again here that uh, the challenge, uh, if you look, among the young people, uh, whether it's Kashmir or any other part where we are facing such issues. A lot of people here talked about Kashmir. We have General Hatas then, he's been serving here. He was an army general, a very popular in Kashmir and being celebrated uh, in Kashmir. He has visited all areas, interacted with young people. So it is always possible if we have a soft approach towards things, if we have an alternate approach, we can always react to violence. But one sort of violence will not justify another sort of violence, that's also important. And we also need to understand the movement, like the security narratives, uh, which we have, counter-terrorism, counter-violence, is always like where we, we try to actually uh, see death as a deterrent or as a solution. But you know, the moment that violence, that encounter ends, for us, the problem ends. But for the people who actually are involved and indulged in violence, they see it is beginning of the process. So that is where the larger challenge actually begins. It begins with the death. It doesn't end with the death. So our initiatives are very event-centric. It is, it, the process begins, uh, the hate begins, the revenge begins after the death. And maybe a lot of initiatives which we have been doing all across the world, they're not working because our issues are very focused. It ends with an encounter, it ends with that event. While the real problem uh, begins from that event. Sure. And that's... Sorry to cut you, I have 10 minutes left, so I want to, you know, open the floor to questions and comments. I have a request, just keep them short so that we can get as many of them in as possible. So if you could just, uh, sorry, Maya is saying something. I think you have about half an hour left. Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, good, then we have, then make your comments long. That's fine. <laughs> and questions, and we'll, we'll give long, leisurely answers. In, 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 in verse, how about that? And music as well. Okay, we have there from the gentleman who was sipping coffee without sharing it earlier. So, Shan Sareen. Uh, it was a very good panel. Uh, my question, however, is, is extremism part of pop culture today? Uh, the reason I'm asking it is, and in India, you know, if I look at the Indian example, We've had what you can call the art culture, the high culture, and we've had the pop culture in India. Sufism was not high culture, it was pop culture. And that, you know, was a syncretic kind of a thing. The high culture of the Darbars uh, was also very, always very exclusivist. It wasn't inclusive. What we are seeing today is uh, Bollywood, for example, and Ashar, you, what you have spoken about, I've always felt this. Uh, it desensitizes people on violence. You know, it's cool. I remember when we were growing up, if you saw blood on screen, you were horrified. Today, if you don't see blood on screen, you are horrified, you know? Uh, and now you see people getting gored into poles and all sorts of weird things happen. The stuff which we see the ISIS do, we see that that is reality television as far as I'm concerned. And Given the popularity of reality TV, which is very voyeuristic in its own way, uh, what the ISIS example was, was voyeurism of the worst kinds. Sure. So is extremism, radicalism today part of pop culture? 
and if I might dare say so, what at least the three of you, not Wahid, uh, he's doing something else, but what the three of you are really talking about uh, is really about high culture and not about pop culture in that sense. Uh, so is there a disconnect and that is why we are not able to actually make the kind of impact that we need to make to control the, uh, the, the, the seduction of radicalism? Can I answer that? Yes, please. But before you do, I just have a quick comment to make on that. One is that the data doesn't quite suggest what is suggested in the sense that if that is as a human condition were true, that the more violent pop culture is, the more violent a society, um, you know, there are films in the West that have been way more violent than Indian, but the data on the progression of violence is not the same. So I think it may be something that one, it seems so, but it may not necessarily be the case. Uh, that's just speaking data-wise, yeah. So we learn violence very early, because when we are playing video games, and I've seen my children playing it, so I know. You have these uh, games where you're banging cars and two people. We never do that on the road, but today you see the kind of road rage that is going on. When I was growing up, we grew up, uh, being ladylike was considered to be a virtue. Today, I think, I don't think uh, uh, the word lady is a very popular one, but uh, not that that, the, uh, what I mean to say is that today we learn violence as children, whereas we didn't when we were younger. So you are banging cars, you are doing this. And another point is that, uh, that you said about the pop culture and the high culture. I was reading, when I was reading up on this uh, conference and the th about it, I read somewhere, I've forgotten where I read, but it said that the Indians, as it is, it's a very minuscule percentage of Indians which go and join the ISIS. And the ones who are joining the ISIS are from a very upper class, highly educated uh, uh, men who have gone and joined it. And the explanation for that was given was that they are in their own mind not fighting the Indian state because they are patriotic, so they are fighting a Western enemy. And also they are fighting for a greater glory, which is the establishment of the cal caliphate. And that is why I said that I keep on saying that more and more we have to know about our own religion, because once you know about your own religion and what the Quran actually says, you realize that this, these boys are being uh, misled and are being brainwashed by these online ummas into believing a very different version of Islam. Because if there is one verse which says that, you know, that was given in a specific context where it says kill the uh, in, in fiddles wherever you find them. That was for a specific battle. But for all time, the ayat is that if you kill one man, it is, uh, or one human being, it is like killing of humanity. Well, although so, I will say that I, I don't think uh, the way to fight radicalism is to try to interpret a book which in any case would be a radicalism of another sort, just reject the no, book. I, I mean, what I'm not I mean to say to, is that I'm you should that know about it. Sure, but I, I, don't, I, I mean, I personally think countering that is not the true interpretation of that this is the true interpretation. It, it need not be an interpretation of something that has been written hundreds of years ago by someone who I don't know. <laughs> it should be, you know, values change, times change. Yeah. I personally don't think a very effective way of finding, fighting something that is going by the book is no, I'll interpret the book for you. You know, forget the book, think for yourself. Okay, so, uh, but yeah, you it's, see, it's that is what the tool that is being used to radicalize them. So when you uh, you are talking to somebody who's radicalized, you have to talk to them in the same language that the other is using for them. Also, you see, if you are going to an online umma and uh, on there you are reading about the Quran, you uh, if they come to me and I start quoting, say Shakespeare or uh, even uh, Majru Sultanpuri or Sahib Rudyani, it's going to make no I'm difference one to one them. One can always quote common sense. I mean, uh, I'm just that will not because they're too brainwashed at that level. So the only thing probably that they initially that they would understand would be a religion and then maybe you can talk to them common sure. sense. That's what yeah. I feel. Go ahead, yeah, I, I, uh, thank you so much for asking that question because I think it's a, the point of how is pop culture and terrorist propaganda related hasn't really been discussed and that's critical. And that we probably should have said at the outset, like why are we sitting up here? Why are we even looking at art and comedy and music and poetry as a way to counter extremist messaging? It's because they were doing it first. And frankly, I think extremists have been better than we have been at using pop culture to spread their message. I'll give you an example. ISIS has created a movie on Twitter. I think it's been removed now, but about a year ago. Um, you know the movie American Sniper with Bradley Cooper? They took that movie, they digitally altered Bradley Cooper's face, put an ISIS guy's face on it, made the Americans look like the bad guys by putting you know, militant wear on them, and they re-released it as ISIS Sniper. And it was a huge hit, and it got millions of views. And they were doing this stuff back when governments 
and well-meaning organizations, I've seen some of the, you know, the counter-extremist messaging from two years ago, and it was usually like a guy in army uniform saying like, beta terrorist mat bano. It's like, what are you gonna listen to? You've got this cool action movie over here saying with guns and women in bikinis and this. I mean, watch the ISIS recruitment videos. They are heavily inspired by pop culture, and our response hasn't been. So the reason we went with comedy was not because, you know, we're so in love with, I mean, I do, I used to write comedy, I like comedy, but I also think that it, our response has to be steeped in pop culture. It has to be cool. It doesn't just have to be um, uh, literary or artistic. It actually has to be pop culture, like you said very eloquently. Like, uh, um, and I think if, if it isn't, they're frankly, so far, unfortunately, I think they've been better at it than we have, but it's a really important point to bring up. Um, we have another question. Um, yes, the gentleman is there. Sorry, just is anyone on this side? Because okay, I'm looking there. Okay, I'll just come to you next. Yes, young man, why don't you come in the spectacles, yeah. Good afternoon. I'm Pranav from Symbiosis International University. My question is that we've been talking about psychocinematics and how vigilantism is being glorified these days and rad radicalizing the viewership. How do you suggest that we tackle it and is putting reasonable restrictions on such content by the state an option? Okay, since you spoke about cinema, you want to take that, so how do you counter that since that is established, as you say? Uh, you know, um, first, um, uh, I'm, um, I'm a free speech extremist, okay? Um, to that extent, you know, even the other question of, uh, uh, you know, what do we do about extremism? The question is, the answer probably is nothing. I'll tell you why, because uh, if, you, if you roll yourselves back a couple of decades and centuries ago, almost every idea would look like an extremist idea to you, which is now you know, accepted as part of our, what we might call as a categorical imperative, right? Something that's undeniable. I mean, equality, fraternity, you know, liberty, I mean, all the, you know, the, the, the buzzwords of modern civilization were extremist ideas. I mean, you know, free, uh, free property, I mean, you know, freehold property, that is private property itself was an extreme idea about 300 years ago, right? Uh, East India Company, which is the f world's first private company, you know, with shareholders and directors, was an extreme idea. So uh, I, d I don't think that, you know, extremism in itself, which is, you know, taking an extreme position, is a problem either way, okay? It's, it's when, it co when it's in contradiction to our uh, well-established notions of liberty, that there is a problem. Okay, I don't even have a problem of it, uh, you know, challenging the state, because I mean, states have come and gone. But it's when you, we have now come around to accepting certain, uh, you know, undeniable values of humanity. Okay, which are actually even bigger than, you know, uh, nationalism or, you know, constitutions or religions and, you know, all these things, I mean, uh, the, the religions and, you know, the, uh, uh, the, uh, we are, they're, they're not orthodox. I mean, you know, ISIS or, you know, the, the Hindu, uh, 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 what is that, Karnataka thing, you know, which killed Gauri. Uh, uh, they, they are not orthodox. They are postmodern, really speaking. Okay, they, they are harking about, uh, back to a past which never existed or, you know, a future which will never exist. So, I mean, they're re really postmodern in that sense. So, uh, uh, but what I'm saying is that we need to be, to know where the targets are a specific community, where the target is violence of a particular sort, and we need to uh, actively discourage them. We cannot stop them, okay? There is no way of stopping this stuff at all. But it's often quite possible, and you've seen this, that you know, when the political dispensation changes, a different kind of culture is produced. Uh, we saw this very at very close quarters in Telangana, okay, uh, where um, I don't know how many of you know this, but I mean, in, uh, in Hyderabad there is a Stangburn, which is a thing which divides the Secunderabad and Hyderabad, the twin cities, and there is a bund over it, and across the bund there were these statues of people who were considered to be the founders of the state in one way or the other, who have been very important for the state, but most of them, it turned out were from the Andhra side and not from the Telangana side. So in one of the political rallies, they pulled down these statues and dumped them into the tank. Okay? 
which was considered to be a, I mean, very extremist, you know, thing to do. And there were people being stopped at the, at the entry points of the city and they were being asked to, um, you know, they were being shown certain vegetables which were pronounced differently between Telangana and Andhra. And they were being asked, what is this? And if you give the wrong answer, you would beat them up. Right? So, uh, what you imagine to be a fairly benign, um, you know, re revolution of sorts for a, for a su separate state actually was turning out to be very violent. Okay. But post Telangana formation, firstly, the, that violence went away. Okay. Many of the people who were involved with the Telangana movement, like Kodan Ram and all that, became, you know, sidelined or they became completely mainstream. But you see the sort of movies which are being produced now by the Telangana film industry. They are very different. Okay. So, um, and what we were doing at Lama Khan was we were trying to uh, relocate, uh, you know, the, the cultural artifacts of Telangana and, you know, try bringing them up, not as a counter to the Andhra culture, but, you know, just discovering what these were, you know, what are these people asking for, you know, what are the... Um, uh, what are the tribal genres of music, uh, you know, their uh, textiles, their cookings, and uh, I mean, you know, what do people in Telangana rural hinterlands cook and eat and, you know, drink? You know, how is their hooch different from that in Andhra? I mean, these are the questions that you need to engage with, not as part of that revolution, but, you know, to dilute the extremism, it's very important for the majority to also engage with that culture, and this is one big problem, right? That you do not engage with their culture. I mean, in Kashmir, if you're going there, okay, uh, how many of cultural productions is the Indian Army attending, or you know, engaging with, or developing an appreciation for? Uh, so I think that is really important. That you know, you you start developing an insider's view of what that culture is to live that life. So also, other than the majority subscribing to that yeah. cultural you identity, subscribe, uh, but <coughs> yeah, but I think, uh, like this podcast says, a very important part of any extremist movement is the bystander. The bystander is very important, and what the bystander, how far he's willing to let the state or the counter-narrative go. And uh, I think we'll need a much longer discussion on that, but there was a young man on this side, yes. Why don't you go ahead, the young man in the blue shirt. Sorry for diverting the topic a little bit, but my question is directly to Vahid, sir. Sir, I really respect your work, what you're doing in JNK, like using sports as a medium to bind people from different backgrounds. But on the contrary, we also have situations where competitive sports are forming separation and, you know, hostility between different fan followings from different countries. Like, recently we had a case where there was a bar fight between people from fans of different teams, and they just started fighting. So, like, my question is directly that where it can bind people, it also has the power to separate people at a competitive level. So, I think, yes, uh, that's a reality that, like, the cricket between India and Pakistan becomes more, you know, dicey than a war. So, it has really polarized tendencies and also creates a lot of fun. But, yes, uh, that's what I was saying, uh, that we are promoting some 52 sports disciplines so that you're not limited to just cricket. Like, football is emerging one of a very... in some of the Scandinavian countries, it's like a religion. So we are promoting football hugely in Kashmir with an idea that you don't have role models just within your continent, India, Pakistan, just they're global, you have Messi, you have Ronaldo, all these people, so that people directly connect with the larger global role models and see people, a lot of positivity in the world. When there is a lot of violence, when there is a lot of cynical things coming out, there are also positive role models across the globe. So that is uh, how we are trying to emerge, that changing, not keeping things just limited to cricket, but also to other sports disciplines. And also, I think, to answer your question, uh, I mean, I, I've noticed, um, I, and I'm pretty old now, but I've always played sport in my life. People who've never played a sport are more violently extremist about teams than those who have. If you're playing a sport, that's where you're focused. Uh, whereas if you're just watching it and getting excited, it's like, you know, you're more interested in proving a sportsman-like behavior in bars and other such. There was a question back there. The mic is now working there, I think. Yeah, we're here. Okay, there's a question here after this. Yeah, it's working now. Go for it. Hello, my name is Hafiz. Firstly, I want to say that I am on the book of news laundry. Thank you. And my question is to Vahid that 
is uh, sports really working in Kashmir as uh, we have seen that uh, uh, army and uh, 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 the state government is doing so much job to promote the sports in Kashmir to de-radicalize de de the youth, but it is not working. The example, uh, the MS Dhoni visited to inaugurate a cricket uh, tournament in uh, Kashmir, and there were some pro azadi slogans and anti-government and anti uh, lots of slogans over there. And for uh, uh, the youth that left the uh, militancy, and he clearly said in, in his video that. He left militancy not because of his love towards the sport, but he left militancy because he, he was too attached to his family and her, his mother was calling to him. So, what are your views? So, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, you know, there's a saying that it leads uh, when it pleads. So, the, that's the basically the blame goes to media that how they actually report that isolated cases are exaggeratedly and highly reported. There are a lot of positive stories happening in Valley which are not reported and which the country also doesn't know about. Uh, but at the same, you know, just you talked about Dhoni's one clip. That's a reality that there were some shows, but uh, that's not all about it. And uh, there are sensitivities to it. When young people who talk on media, they will not say, because the, the local situations are so vulnerable that uh, the safety of life, family is the priority. So there are a lot of things which people do not even talk on media or social media don't want to talk about it because given the insecurity they are, they are and the hostile atmosphere they have in the villages. But it is making a huge inroad, not absolute. I mean, sports is just one medium of engagement. It is not the absolute engagement. There is a political level to it. But uh, one important thing which we observed during our lot of uh, you know, research which we have done very recently, like the uh, JNK government did uh, announced an amnesty uh, against the stone pelters who were involved. Some 12,000 people were indulging in street protests. And the age group, if you look at the age group uh, who got amnesty, 12,000 people, these are children below 18. So more than ideology, there is an age issue as well. Then militancy, the recent like recruitments from last uh, five, six years. So these are children below 25 who are getting recruited. After 25, you don't, the moment you cross an age after 25, so you are neither recruiting as a militant or neither getting indulgent to street protest, which means there is, a, there is an is age the issue which needs a bracket. consistent hand holding and sports is part of it, political education is also part of it. It's not always uh, ideological as much as it's an age issue which we are facing in Kashmir. So that's, I think, where the intervention is coming. Right. Thank we have a question right here. And then there's one there. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Thank you once again to uh, ORF and uh, for co-organizing co this, uh, this event. Um, I come from Geneva, from Geneva Center for Security Policy, and you might have heard when I, I did one of the opening speech, uh, this topic is very important for us. But first of all, I would like to thank you, because you do an extraordinary job in bringing a positive uh, movement in the world of countering or preventing violent extremism and, and, and fostering peace. So my background is on intelligence, military, and diplomacy for more than 30 years. And this topic was never on our agenda. Even the Swiss, who are famous for mediation, good offices, but it was never on the agenda of uh, the foreign ministry, of the defense ministry. And what we have done in Geneva is we have uh, had the pleasure of, uh, of hosting a Syrian refugee a fellow that was uh, the Good Morning Syria woman who was on radio and for seven years, one out of two Syrian were listening to her on the radio. And when she noticed as a first private radio in the country, the power she had on microphone to influence people. Then you can see how what you, whatever you say on the, on, on the mic is very important to fostering peace or to fuel conflict. And so what we did, we invested seeds money on her, and she developed a new concept called Media and Art for Peace, where you combine all sorts of social medias and traditional medias and all sorts of art. And what we see now, after two years of this uh, new initiative, new funding, we have seen that there's a lot of interest in two segments. The first segment is youth, bachelor degrees, people at universities. There is a keen interest because the combination of two of the media, as you said, Frank, before, the media is very impactful and comedies and also the different forms of arts. And the second layer that we see a lot of interest is a very high level of government. 
So for example, tomorrow we have a show in Geneva at the UN Assembly Hall called Seven. It's a show, it's a, a theater where women who suffer from domestic violence will be able to, uh, to have their voice. And among the speakers, we have generals. So we see this is a level of government, ambassador or general that are very also interesting in this topic. So in order for, to foster this movement, we have created an online course called Media and Art for Peace. And it's uh, open to everyone because we want to make it a movement to help you and help your colleagues have better understanding and better um, uh, uh, acknowledgement within different parts of, of government and so on. So I invite you to have a look at the website and in every way we as a center co-organizing, co-sponsoring this event, can you please uh, uh, join us and once again thank you so much for all the work you are doing. Great, thank you. Yeah. So yeah, check out that website and that course, um, the young lady here. Good afternoon, my name is Aishwarya Srivastava. Uh, my question is as follows. Given the reach of audiovisual communication through the mediums of, uh, say, films and the music, music industry and the radio, mainstream cinema or the music industry can have and does have a very strong impact on the audience that it caters to. However, artists who drive these mediums take very little responsibility to include such content that we're talking about today in uh, mainstream art, right? Therefore, we fall back on mediums such as uh, YouTube channels or stand-up comedians um, that do not have as much voluntary viewership as does Bollywood or the music industry. Therefore, to what extent does such expression really result in the radicalization? Would anyone like to take that? You yeah, want to take sure. That? Um, yeah, you're right. In terms of pure scale, nothing would match Bollywood or Hollywood at the moment. One thing I take, uh, I take heart in, though, is that I think we're on the right track targeting social influencers because I think that trend is changing. So in Asia right now, if you're under 30 years old, statistically, you watch 2.5 times more content on YouTube than you do on television. And that's different from five years ago when it was about 50-50. So in just five years, YouTube has shot up so much, and I think that's probably just going to continue as time goes on. Um, but I do, I do share your frustration, I think, with mainstream stars who are unwilling to sort of talk about this. I take some, I, I think there is reason to be hopeful, though. Bollywood especially has shown a maturity, I think, in storytelling now. Recently, um, movies are taking on topics that are a little bit more controversial. But I think until they get to that level, and even if they never do, what we can be um, sort of hopeful about is the fact that YouTube, Facebook Live, um, Instagram, you know, the videos on Instagram are taking over now. Um, they're getting much more viewership. So I would say just that it's, it's more a bet on the future, that um, uh, it's, it's going to overtake mainstream soon, but it certainly hasn't yet. Yeah, uh, I'd agree with that. And I'd just add one more thing why I think that's the case is because in the digital age, see, uh, I mean, let's talk about the Jagged Little Pill, Alanis Morissette's first album, after which she hasn't come with anything of consequence. You know, she broke up, it was a you know, cry of the heart. Art typically, at its most impactful, is authentic. It comes from a place of, like Sahil Ludhiani's poetry when he wrote for himself, is different from when he wrote for a film, when he just had to write lyrics and you're meeting a deadline. And commerce, the way, uh, and being a producer myself of, uh, of television shows, a commercial aspect to making a show or a film doesn't have that authenticity, that, that kind of, but the digital age does, YouTube does. And then for that to go viral or to become mainstream, the likelihood of it happening is much higher now and as digital becomes the default oh. setting. And also, sorry, just quickly to add, it doesn't have the immediacy either exactly. that YouTube has. Um, we made another video with East India Comedy about the Uri attacks, right? That came out two days after the Uri incident happened. Even if we got Ali Abhat or some huge Bollywood star to agree to make a movie on that, by the time that movie hit theaters, it would be two years later. And also, they're much more cost effective. The average YouTube star with over 10,000 subscribers releases a new video every three days. You compare that to the life cycle of making a movie or a TV show where you invest a lot of money, it's not cost effective, and there's no guarantee it would even be a hit. The intersection of art and commerce is a tricky space. And on that note, thank you, panel. That was a wonderful discussion. We all learned so much. I know I did. I hope others did too.
Thank you for your time. Thank you, audience, for your questions.